Okay, let me read uh, Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. All right, let's just quickly review what we've learned so far. First of all, the essential nature of this book that we are studying is that it is a revelation. It is a revealing. It is an uncovering. Okay, the central theme of the book of Revelation is the glory of Jesus Christ, particularly related to his return. The divine source of the book of Revelation is God the Father. The specific recipients are his bond servants, namely believers, Christians. The prophetic character of the book has to do with the things that must soon take place. That is, the book of Revelation is mainly a prophecy of the future. The supernatural delivery of the book, we learned that it is delivered uh, uh, through angels. Uh, the human recipient, the human agent is the Apostle John. And the spiritual blessedness of this book is indicated in verse 3 for those who, who hear this book and for those who listen to it and those who heed what it says. As I mentioned to you last week, this is the only book in the Bible that says you will be blessed if you listen to what it says and then do what it says. And all of this leads us to our next point that I want to make, and that is its compelling urgency. The compelling urgency. Look at the end of verse 3. It says, because the time is near. Folks, the time is near. The word time there, by the way, is not chronos, where we get chronology and chronological. That's everyday time. That's clock time. Okay, that's, that's regular time. No, the Greek word that's used there is a very special word. It's kairos. Okay, the time, the chirotic time is near. Okay, that Greek word means a special time, an opportune time, okay, a special moment in time. And then the word near, of course, indicates that this special moment in time is going to happen, as I mentioned last week. The very next event in the redemptive plan of God is that Christ will return. That's what all of this is leading to. Now, this, this, this whole idea of the imminence of Christ's return. Go to uh, um, um, Revelation chapter 22, verse 6 for a moment. Chapter 22, verse 6. Listen to what it says there. Revelations 22, verse 6. The angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his, show his servants the things that, what, must soon take place. Okay, these things are going to happen soon, okay? Jump down to verse 10, okay? It says here, and he told me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book because the time is near. Now, listen, do you see what the Holy Spirit is doing here? What the Holy Spirit is doing here is he is forcing everybody in the church to live in the light of the fact of Christ's return as the next great event. And since we don't know particularly, specifically, when that is going to happen, we, we, we have to live our lives as though it could happen at any moment. That's the urgency. That's the expectancy that the New Testament has, and it culminates here in the book of Revelation. Now, we find this idea of urgency, we find this idea of expectancy throughout the New Testament. Let me give you some examples. For example, James chapter 5 says... You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble with each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The Lord is standing at the door. And then in Romans 16, verse 20, it says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Both of those words there, tachos, remember, we get the word tachometer from, okay? We talked about that word last week. Both of them are used there. And then look at uh, Luke chapter 18, verses 7 and 8. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? In other words, what Jesus is talking about here is, okay, here we have godly people crying out to the Lord, Lord, please come, please come, please come. And then Jesus says, I tell you the truth, he will come quickly 
to bring about justice. So this idea of him coming quickly, standing at the door, coming soon, they all mean this eminence of Christ's return. But listen to also what Jesus says. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? What's he talking about there? He's talking about the fact that his coming may seem long to us to the point where people will begin to believe that he's not coming at all, that none of these prophecies are true. Folks, this is why we need to be involved in evangelism. This is why we need to be involved in witnessing, okay? We must tell other people about Jesus Christ right now, okay? There is an urgency involved in it. They might not have tomorrow. We might not have tomorrow. We don't know when Christ is going to return, okay? And that's one of the ideas that we find throughout the New Testament that culminates in the book of Revelation, this urgent plea. That's why we have to live a life pleasing to the Lord, always, because we don't know when he's going to come back. And when he comes back, we want him to be proud of us. So do you see what the Holy Spirit is doing here? Urging us, prompting us through this, trying to motivate us to live a life pleasing to the Lord and to do evangelism and to share our witness with other people because we don't know when Christ is going to return. Now, this brings us to our next point, the Trinitarian benediction. Look at verses 4 and 5. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now let's take a closer look at this. First, John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. That's Asia Minor. That's modern Turkey. And these are to the seven churches that are located in the western half of Asia Minor. They're, they're mentioned, by the way, in verse 11. Um, Ephesus, uh, Smyrna, Pergium, Thyatira, Sardis, uh, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. They were the direct recipients, earthly recipients of this letter, and we're going to be studying those cities and studying those particular churches in great detail when we get to chapters 2 and 3. But it says to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you. Now that's the standard greeting, grace and peace to you. And then here comes the wonderful Trinitarian benediction. Folks, this is God pouring out his love upon us. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kingdoms of the earth. By the way, a benediction is a blessing that we receive, right? At the end of the service, I give you a benediction and I ask God to bless all of us, all right? So a benediction is a blessing that we receive. We're going to talk in a little bit about a doxology. That is the praise that we give to God, okay? So we're talking about God blessing us. Here comes grace and peace from the whole Trinity to the seven churches in Asia Minor and by extension to all of us today. Folks, this is a love letter. This is God the Father giving you his love, God the Holy Spirit giving you his love, and Jesus Christ giving you his love, okay? All three members of the Trinity. And by the way, if all three members of the Trinity are, are, are uh, uh, wishing that you get uh, grace and peace, I can tell you one thing, you're definitely going to get grace and peace. You see, this is when uh, verse 3 talks about a blessing from God. Here it is. This is what they're talking about. This is where the blessing stems from. So let's take a closer look at this. First, we have God. God the Father is identified. Him who is and who was and who is to come, okay? The eternal God, all blessings, all grace, all peace ultimately come from him. Now, I can't resist showing you something very, very fascinating, okay? Obviously, this sees God in the dimensions of time. Although God is timeless, it sees God in the dimension of time because that's the only way that we can understand it, right? So he, he was, he is, he is to come. So it's talking about God in terms of the past, the present, and the future, okay? So um, go to Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. We see a similar phrase. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Again, God is described as the one who is, the one who was, and the one who will come, and also the Almighty. Look at chapter 4, verse 8 for a moment. Chapter 4, Revelation, verse 8. Again, notice what it says. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. 
Jump up to chapter 11, verse 17. We get a similar phrase, chapter 11, verse 17. We give thanks to you, O God, O Lord, O God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and begun to reign. Wait a minute, there's something missing there. There's no who is to come. Why? Because by the time you get to chapter 11, in this song of praise, it's already pictured as God reigning here on earth. God has come back, okay? Chapter 16, verse 5. Go to chapter 16, verse 5 in the book of Revelation for a moment. Chapter 16, verse 5. Then I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, You are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged. Isn't it great? We don't have to say the one who is to come anymore. Why? Because he's already come. By the time we get to these parts of the book of Revelation, he's already come. So, this is the eternal God, God the Father, who is sending you his blessing. Then John moves on to the second member of the Trinity. Verse 4, Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. John said to the seven churches in Asia, in the province of Asia Minor, grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne. Okay, now I know what all of you are thinking. You're going, wait a minute, I thought there was only one Holy Spirit. Now it's saying that there's seven. What's going on here? Well, first of all, there is only one Holy Spirit, okay? Well, why does it say seven? Well, many translations say the sevenfold spirit, okay? But there are, there are several possibilities as to why John is describing the Holy Spirit this way. First of all, you remember last week I told you about seven and what seven represents, completeness, fullness, okay? So it could be that the number seven here, the seven spirits before the throne of God represents the, the, the fullness, identifying the fullness of the Holy Spirit, okay? Uh, but it could also go back to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. Why don't you go there right now? Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. By the way, remember when we started this uh, this study, I told you that one of the great things about studying the book of Revelation is you really study the whole Bible. Well, here we are. Now we're going to start looking at different passages because I want to tie all these things together so you can see the totality of the Word of God in the book of Revelation. So in Isaiah chapter 11, we have a wonderful statement there, chapter 11, verse 2, about the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 11, verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. There you have seven aspects of the Holy Spirit mentioned. Number one, he's the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, of strength, of knowledge, the fear of the Lord. That's the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit. Okay, That's one possibility. Go to Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4. Because there's also the possibility that John is referring to Zechariah chapter 4, all right? In Zechariah chapter 4, verses 2 through 10, we get a very, very interesting, okay, and revealing aspect of the Holy Spirit also. We find reference to seven aspects of the Holy Spirit, uh, seven spirits of the Lord. I, uh, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 2 says this. He asked me, what do you see? I said, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl on the top and seven lights on it with seven channels to the lights. What is he talking about? He's talking about a Jewish menorah. You ever see a menorah, right? You have one candle in the middle. You have three on each side. So, so, so the, the, the person that the Lord is talking to now is seeing the, the menorah. It's all lit. There's seven lights on it, okay? And then there's one candle in the middle, all right? And then if you jump down to Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10, it says these... Seven are the eyes of the Lord which reign throughout the earth. Okay, so you say, well, well, what's the connection? Well, right in the middle of this passage in Zechariah chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, it says this. He cried, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. This is who he's speaking to. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Okay, so notice. Not by might, not by power, but by what? By his Holy Spirit, okay? So the symbolism in Zechariah chapter 4 is very close to what we find in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, okay? 
and the, pro- the work of the Holy Spirit is very prominent in chapter 4 of Zechariah. In fact, go to Revelation chapter 5, verse 6 for a moment. Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, because we find a wonderful connection to Zechariah chapter 4 here. Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. It had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits, or some translations have the sevenfold spirit of God sent out into all of the earth. That's almost an exact interpretation of Zechariah chapter 4. So here's my point. Whether the seven spirits in, uh, in, in, in Revelation chapter 1 are referring to the fullness of the Holy Spirit, represented by the number seven, whether it's referring to the sevenfold work of the Spirit in Isaiah 11, or whether it's referring to the seven lamps, seven eyes concept in Zechariah chapter 4 that is repeated again in Revelation chapter 5, what I want you to grab a hold of is in Revelation chapter 1 verse 4, John is talking about God the Holy Spirit, okay? So it is the Holy Spirit who is in his full glory uh, who sends us grace and peace. You see, folks, isn't this wonderful? What is going on here at the beginning of the book of Revelation? God the Father and God the Holy Spirit are sending us their wishes for grace and for peace. But that's not all, because then John moves on to the remaining member of the Trinity. Look at verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the rulers of the kings of the earth. What a glorious description that is of Jesus Christ. Now, John, of course, takes more time to to describe Jesus Christ than he did the Spirit or the Father, but after all, uh, the primary theme of this book is about Jesus Christ. So we have to remember something before we get into the description of Jesus, okay? This book, this entirety of this book, as I said, it's the most Christ-exalting book in all of the Bible. And what it's talking about is the vision of Christ's ultimate victory. And it is sent to uh, the persecuted and, and the disheartened Christians in Asia Minor who had undergone tremendous suffering, okay? And what God is doing through this letter that John is writing is he's trying to encourage them about the future. They have undergone tremendous persecution. And so this letter is saying, look, no matter what happens to you right now, okay, no matter what your situation is, God is still in control, and Jesus Christ is going to return, and things are going to be very, very different in the near future. So what's the first thing that would encourage these Christians in Asia Minor undergoing persecution? How about that God the Father, the Eternal One, had not forgotten about them, and that he sends them grace and peace? What's the second thing that would encourage them? How about God the Holy Spirit hadn't forgotten about them, and he sends them grace and peace also? And what's the third thing that would encourage them? Their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the Son, had not forgotten about them, and he sends them grace and peace. That's what's going on here. That's the Trinitarian benediction, okay? Now let's just take a closer look at what he says about Jesus, okay? First of all, John says that he is the faithful witness. Now, we've spoken about being a faithful witness, okay, last week, okay? What is a witness? What's a good witness? Somebody who faithfully describes what it is that they've seen, okay? And Jesus Christ always tells the truth. Jesus Christ is the faithful witness to what God has done, okay? In fact, look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 for a moment. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. Notice what it says. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. There's Jesus Christ again, referred to as the faithful and true witness. Second of all, John calls him the firstborn of the dead. What does that mean, the firstborn of the dead? Here's what it means. It means that Jesus is the preeminent one. The Greek word that's used there, prototokos, that's translated firstborn, it means preeminent. It means first in importance, okay? 
of all of the people who will ever be raised, Jesus Christ is the most outstanding one, the most distinguished one, the greatest one, the most important one, the preeminent one, okay? He's also the first in, in, in the line, okay? But it refers to the greatness of Jesus Christ. In fact, this book is the story of, of the Prototokos, the chief of all who will ever be raised, okay? Third John refers to him as the ruler of the kings of the earth. The ruler of the kings of the earth. The Greek word there is archon. It means ruler, chief, sovereign, okay? It means all of those things. God will make him the ruler of the earth. Revelations 19, verse 16 says, On his robe and on his thigh he has written this name, King of kings and Lord of lords. And oh, what a ruler he is. Let me just give you some other titles for Jesus in the Bible. Daniel chapter 4, verse 37, he's called the king of heaven. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, he's called the king of the Jews. In John chapter 1, verse 49, he's called the king of Israel. In 1 Timothy 1, 17, he's called the king of the ages. In Psalm 24, verse 7, he's called the king of glory. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 3, he's called the king of the saints. And here we have him as the king of kings. Now, when you review these titles, okay, the faithful witness speaks of his past. It speaks of his past, to what God has done in the past. Jesus is the faithful witness. The firstborn of the dead, the resurrected Lord, the prototokos, the chief of all who will ever be raised, that's his present role. And then when it talks about the ruler of the kings of the earth, that's his future role. So do you see how the people in Asia Minor would have been encouraged by this letter? And this leads us to our final point here in the introduction, and that is the exalted doxology. Again, doxology is the praise that we give to God. You know, John can't contain himself. He's only six verses into this letter, and already he's praising the Lord. Look at verse 6. Because Jesus Christ is the one who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, and he has made us into a kingdom of priests to his God and Father, and thus to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is an exalted hymn of praise, okay? Notice it says, unto him who loves us. Folks, the Greek there is the present tense. The present tense. An abiding love right now. Remember what I read in our prayer, okay? Paul says that nothing will separate us from the love of God. Folks, God's love for us is not in the past. Just remember that. Always remember that. God's love for us is not in the past, okay? God's love for us at this present moment in time is just as intense as it was when Jesus died on the cross for us. Jesus loved us when we hated him, and he keeps on loving us now that we belong to him, okay? He loves us, and in the past he released us from our sins by his blood on the cross. The blood, by the way, refers to the atoning work of Christ. By the way, any time in the Bible when you hear any reference to the blood of Jesus Christ, it's not thinking about hemoglobin. It's thinking about the complete redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross. The sacrificial, substitutionary death of Jesus Christ on the cross. He released us from our sins, okay? What's the gospel of Jesus Christ? Jesus is born into this world. He lives a perfect life. He does not sin one time. He fulfills all of the requirements of the Old Testament law so that when he goes to the cross, he has no sins of his own, and that allows God to punish him in our place. And so when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are accepting, you are allowing, you understand what happened that day when Jesus died. God punished him in your place. Jesus gives you his righteousness. So when God looks at the Christian today, he doesn't see our sins because they were paid for by Jesus on the cross. But furthermore, he sees us covered in the righteousness of Christ, positive righteousness, so that we can have a relationship with Almighty God right now. That's what John is talking about here, okay? And that's something that all of us should know and that we should be able to explain to anybody who asks us. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So... But John goes even further than that. It's not just what God saved us from. It's what he saved us to. Look at what it says here. Look at verse 6. It says that he saved us and he made us into a kingdom. 
Now, what does that mean, he made us into a kingdom? Well, it means that we now, Christians, constitute a kingdom. We have a king, and we have a common life under the authority of that king. This is a collective designation for all believers. All who believe in Jesus Christ are under the sphere, the influence of the Lord God Almighty. And that kingdom is entered into by faith in Jesus Christ, okay? He loved us so much that he released us from our sins through his blood uh, on the cross when he died for us. But he loves us so much that he also made us into a community of saints forever bound together in the kingdom over which he rules. And we enjoy his, his rule. We enjoy his loving sovereignty, his almighty protection. Folks, we have been given the privilege. We have been given the privilege to be ruled by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And when we get to the millennium, you're going to find out how we are going to rule with him. Furthermore, John says that he made us into priests. What does this mean, that he made us into priests? Well, what it means is that we now have direct and immediate access to Almighty God. Direct and immediate access. A priest is the one who had the right to enter God's presence, okay? In ancient Israel, the priest and the priest alone could enter the holy place, and only once a year, <coughs> on the Day of Atonement, could he enter the Holy of Holies, okay? Only once a year could he do that. But what is John saying here? Now we're all priests. We're all priests. We all have immediate and direct access to God. Did you hear that? Immediate and direct access to Almighty God. Did you realize that in the ancient Near East, if you wanted to see Pharaoh or if you wanted to see the king, you had to be invited? Remember the book of Esther? Esther wants to go see uh, um, um, Artaxerxes, and, and she has to hang out in the garden in a beautiful dress, hoping that he would look out the window and want to see her. You know why? If you went into the presence of the king without being invited, it was immediate death. Immediate death. Okay? There were strict regulations in the Old Testament about who and when could enter the holy place. Wouldn't all of you guys like to have direct and immediate access to the President of the United States? Maybe because you, you, you're not sure who's the next president. Gonna, okay, fine. All right, how, how, all right let, let me pick a better example. How about your doctor? Would you like direct and immediate access to your doctor? You don't have to go through a secretary. You don't have to wait for them to see you. You can just, anytime you got a problem, you just blow right into the office. They drop everything, and they sit down, and they meet with you here. Is that, is that better? You like that example better? Okay, fine. All right. Guess what? That's what we have with Almighty God. We don't have to wait to talk to God. We don't have to wait to see God. We don't have to go through a secretary. We're not going to be put on hold, and half the time, you know what they do? They put you on hold, and then they drop the call. You, got, you know they do that on purpose, right? Okay. There's no middleman between us and God. We have immediate and direct access to Almighty God. What a blessing. And let me ask you this question. What's the primary way that we access God? Through our prayers. Folks, you've got to be spending time in prayer in your life. The single most important thing that all of you can do as a Christian is pray. Pray. That is how we communicate with God. That's the primary way that we develop our relationship with Almighty God, all right? So John is saying that we, we have direct and immediate access to Almighty God. That's why we believe in the priesthood of all believers, okay? And then he says here, to him who loves us and who released us from our sins by his blood and made us into a kingdom over which he rules and made us priests who have immediate and direct access to God the Father, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Glory and dominion. You know what that means? That means that Jesus Christ should have eternal plays, praise, eternal glory, and eternal sovereignty. That's what dominion means. In fact, it would be an eternal injustice if Jesus Christ did not get the glory and the dominion forever and ever. So the question is, are we giving Jesus Christ the glory and the dominion in our life? That's the question that we have to answer, okay? So, do you see how we have to live our lives with a sense of urgency, with the return of Jesus Christ as eminent, okay? Folks, this, when the, when, when the book of Revelation starts off by saying, you will be blessed if you listen and then you heed what it says, this is what it's talking about. The most Christ-exalting book in the whole Bible. We're blessed when we exalt Jesus Christ in our life, okay? 
That's what it's talking about here. And then it ends with that wonderful word, amen, which means let it be, let it be, okay? So listen, we're done with the introduction, okay? This is John's introduction, and he sweeps us in, up into wonderful praise <coughs> and wonderful glory of the Trinity, particularly Jesus Christ, okay? And, and, and I know that we are going to be blessed as a congregation and as individual Christians as we proceed, as now we start to look into the future, okay? Well, we're going to go to the seven churches in Asia Minor first, and then we're going to look into the future. But, but, but that's what the book of Revelation is trying to do. Get us to exalt Jesus Christ in our lives. Amen? Let's pray.